Today we have with us Professor Julian Reed, who is a political theorist, philosopher, and professor of international relations at the University of Lapland, Finland. He is renowned for his advance of the theory of biopolitics, contributions to cultural theory, and postcolonial thought, and the critique of liberalism. You have recently been in Copenhagen to talk about indigeneity and the politics of hope. Tell us about this topic and your research on it. Sure, yeah, so the Politics of Hope is a workshop which arises from a Finnish Academy funded project that I'm involved with back in Lapland where I teach and where we've been working on the subject of indigenous politics but also the question of, of hope in theoretical terms and um, the workshop brought together scholars from a variety of different places and approaching hope, the Politics of Hope from different angles. I was, I was there to talk about the, what I see as being the shift from hope to hopelessness in critique and the way in which, um, especially within queer theory and the work of Laurent Ballant, we see this idea of um, the necessity to sacrifice hope as a precondition for politics and the embrace of, of hopelessness as a condition and as, a, as, a, as an ethos for rethinking political subjectivity. And I, in my paper, I was trying to problematize that by reading some contemporary cinema and especially the, the work of Bella Tarr and his uh, last film, very last film, called The Turin Horse, which is also um, an iconic film in terms of the, the cinema of the Anthropocene. And I'm sure you're familiar with the way in which the Anthropocene is being understood as a kind of hopeless condition for humanity, the end of, of, of human possibility and acceptance, so to speak, of the, uh, the hopelessness of the future. And what I was doing in the paper was using Tar's film to, to really challenge that basic idea and to show how, contrary to the way in which it's been interpreted, both within cinema studies, but also politics and, and geography and other sciences, um, it's really a very hopeful film. And it's, it's, it's made in a way that's designed to, to show us the possibility for political agency and political subjectivity in the context of the apparent hopelessness of the um, contemporary condition. The film features uh, a father-daughter couple who live in the middle of nowhere and uh, are apparently faced with a hopeless future. Um, but the film also involves two very um, powerful scenes, one in which a neighbor taps at the door and asks for brandy and then comes inside and then um, makes a remarkable speech denouncing the prevailing political and social conditions. But secondly, and more importantly, as I talk about in the paper, a scene where a band of gypsies approach the house, um, apparently to steal water from the couple. This is the father's fear. He sends the daughter out to prevent the gypsies from, from stealing water. As it happens, they're not there to steal the water. They give money for the water. And they also denounce the father, the patriarch, tell him that he's a worm. And, uh, and then they invite the daughter to, to go off with them, ride off into the sunset on their beautiful horses and live out a different, a different life in the, con in the context of this apparent hopelessness. So in other words, they give her hope were she able to, to, to seize her chance, which I think is, um, as I explained in the paper, very, very powerful. Thank you. Um, your other work extends Foucault's concept of biopolitics in a critique of the discourse of development and the construction of what you call resilient subjects. In our neoliberal age, varied global forms of biopolitics have emerged and impacted post-coloniality. Tell us how the notion of biopolitics in our present times impacts the field of post-colonial studies. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, when I started out looking at development back in the, the previous decade, sort of 2008, 2009, I was coming at it thinking about the ways in which it had been um, correlated with security historically throughout, throughout the entire colonial era in terms of the way in which the colonial project was always a kind of security project, a way of securing uh, the, the social and political and economic future of the West by exploiting other people and also by um, creating regimes, apparatuses with which to prevent the, um, the emergence of threats in the non-Western world, gov governing the non-West so as to uh, improve Western security and showing how that continues and has only grown in the post-Cold War era, the supposedly post-colonial era, the era in which um, formal colonial rule came to an end. But as I got into the project and researched this topic, I became more and more interested in the ways in which development itself as a concept and as a discourse has shifted. 
and how it's been reconceptualized in apparently more positive terms as so-called sustainable development, you know, concerned with protecting the environment and the biosphere and so on and so forth, as opposed to simply developing human economies and human, human well-being, specifically Western human well-being. And at the same time as noting that shift, I also noted a shift from uh, the correlation of development to security to the correlation of sustainable development with this, this seemingly new notion of resilience, which was a pretty new concept in discourse when I began looking at it back in 2008, 2009. So I was interested in what was going on there by, um, politically and also biopolitically in terms of this shift. You know, Foucault and Foucault-inspired scholarship, especially in international relations, wider fields too, has um, provided wonderful insights into the way in which uh, these rationalities of development and security developed historically and, and became tied together you know, using his lectures on security, uh, territory and population. Um, what I started to see when looking at this new regime of power that emerged through the discourse of sustainable development and resilience was a kind of a kind of biopolitical shift from a concern with securing the life of human populations to one concern with securing the life of the biosphere and the environment. That would that would seem to be the shift in the discourse. And at the same time as this shift has occurred, we can also see that the human itself has been reproblematized as a kind of threat to the environment and to the biosphere in a way which I think is, is, is certainly biopolitical. It's still, a, it's still a story of life and the politics of life. It's just simply no longer the life of the human which is being targeted or, or for improvement. It's, it's now the biosphere. And at the same time, we see the human being pathologized as the source of the deepest threat to the biosphere. Of course, it's not all of humanity or humanity per se, because when we look into the discourse of, of of, of where these threats are said to exist and emerge, we find that it's particular kinds of human. So it's specifically the, the global poor who are seen to be the largest threat to, to the resilience of, um, of the biosphere and the environment. And we see policies and practices coming into existence which in turn target the poor with, 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 with violence and uh, other, other, other kinds of uh, discipline globally. How do you see the trajectory of Foucault's work in its impact and relationship with post-colonial thought? Um, and this is because Foucault's work has often been critiqued for having a lacuna in any sustained criticism or analysis of colonialism, uh, or for his Eurocentrism. Yet, obviously, his work and conceptual tools have heavily influenced the field of post-colonial studies. How do you understand this irony of Foucault's absorption within post-colonial studies? Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it is an irony that, that he has been so powerful in post-colonial studies. I mean, on, yeah, on the one hand, we, we often hear the, the critique, the argument that oh, he has this kind of blind spot. He, he doesn't go beyond the West. He doesn't write about the non-Western world. I mean, actually, it's not true. I mean, his writings from Iran, as journalistic as they might have been, you know, they, they were written for newspapers. Know, express very directly, very clearly his, his immense, immense interest in, in the non-Western world. And I think you know, we can be certain that had he lived longer, that he would have expanded upon that. And I think, I think tho those writings are, are incredibly important for understanding um, the, the post-colonial condition today and the potential uh, and the importance of analysis of um, non-Western dynamics. You know, he calls the Iranian Revolution back in the late 70s, the first meaningful revolt against globalization. This is what he says about it. You know, it's, incredible. it's incredible the importance which he attached to what was going on there in Iran. And clearly he saw, saw what was going on in the non-Western world and the non-West itself as incredibly interesting and important. That said, of course, I do accept the fact that I'm also not here to defend Foucault as such. Of course, it's true that he writes mostly about the West. He's fascinated with the history of the West. But most importantly of all, with debunking the, author the, the authoritative history of the West, and, and more especially still, image of the West as this um, benign, superior kind of civilization. You know, all of his work from beginning to end is a demolition of that, of that, that image and that idea in a way that bids very directly and very powerfully into the, into, 
the post-colonial critique and any critique as such of the of Western hubris and uh, that's how I that's how I see Foucault. <laughs> um, you talk about the neoliberal notion of development that interpolates resilient subjects in a specific way that is constantly struggling with a dangerous and othered world. What happens to the concept of political agency or resistance in resilient subjects then? Well, I think I think resilience and and, and resistance are. are Totally different, even opposed modes of being, and I think I think really the project of resilience is about it's about destroying resistance, the capacity for resistance, and to convincing human beings that that um, resistance is is futile, that we cannot hope to transform prevailing social and political conditions such that a new world would be possible or or even come into existence. This is what the discourse of resilience really preaches and the project is designed to make human beings accept the supposed reality that all we can hope for is to preserve the existing world that we live in, existing prevailing social and political conditions and accommodate ourselves to the dangers and threats which it poses for our lives. So rather than thinking in terms of being able to change the world and uh, destroy the sources of those threat and danger such that we could achieve something like security. It preaches the idea that all we can do is change ourselves in response to threats and dangers which are seen to be endemic and impossible to avoid. So I really see resilience and resistance in opposite terms, com conflicting terms. And the project of recovering the capacity of resistance requires that we defeat this this poison uh, called resilience. Uh, in the beginning, you talked about indigeneity and the politics of hope that you recently talked um, uh, at Copenhagen. Um, what does the term post-coloniality then mean for Finland, where you research and work right now? Uh, and how does that then uh, merge or intersect with the whole concept of indigeneity? It's a good question. It's a complex question, I think. I mean, on the one hand, what we see is, a, is, is an apparent sea change in um, not just Finland, but the whole of the, the Nordic region, Scandinavia too, but also, and also globally, in terms of the way in which um, the responsibility and disposition of the West to indigenous peoples is conceptualized and articulated. So. The West, in general, is very, very um, keen now to express its historical guilt, its debt, and its responsibility for now improving the conditions of indigenous peoples, which for, for decades, if not centuries, uh, they have been persecuting and, and effectively attempting to destroy, to wipe out in, in, in many places. And that's still, that's still something which is going on, of course, you know, still a, a reality of the condition of many indigenous peoples in different places. But we also see what is fascinating is this new discourse, this new approach, which would seem to be much more benign, much more hopeful, much more concerned with promoting the rights and the well-being of indigenous people to enabling their life. And again, of course, this bids into a, a biopolitical problematic of, you know, is this simply benign or is it a new form of power at work in terms of the way in which the indigenous are now being apparently taken care of and, and um, made to live in, in certain ways. But um, going beyond that, it's also really interesting, I think important to look at the way in which a certain model of indigeneity today is being reified and the, what the way in which indigeneity itself is being correlated with resilience. So when Western powers when regimes and international organizations and states want to talk about exemplars of resilience and resilient subjects, they often talk about indigenous people. And this is very much the case where I live in, in Finland and in the, um, the wider Arctic region, because of course I don't just live in Finland, I also live in, in Lapland in the north of Finland, which is part of the, falls within the Arctic Circle itself, uh, which is governed by this thing called the Arctic Council. Um, which is made up of different, the different Arctic states and different um, stakeholders and so forth, 
and which has become very, very interested in promoting resilience within the Arctic as a way of responding to the really catastrophic threats which indigenous peoples, as well as everybody who lives within the Arctic, is faced with today in terms of climate change and global warming and so on and so forth. Uh, I find that really interesting, of course, knowing, knowing how, how deeply um, malevolent this discourse of resilience can be and, and, and is, I think, becoming in, in the Arctic. So when the Arctic Council wants to talk about resilience, when it wants to point us in the direction of examples of, re of resilience, it's of, it often talks about indigenous people like the Sami, for example, of, of Finnish, Finnish Lapland, of Lapland as a whole, as an exemplar of resilience, which on the one hand would seem to, to privilege indigenous people like the Sami, but I think also actually works to, um, to subjugate them, as well as to subjugate everybody else who it's demanded must become resilient like the indigenous peoples of the Arctic supposedly are. Because once we scratch beneath the surface of this discourse and the practices and policies which they involve, we find that resilience in the Arctic as well as elsewhere really means developing yourself as a neoliberal kind of subject. To be a resilient subject is to be a, ne a neoliberal subject, a subject capable of uh, surviving and adapting to all kinds of threats and dangers and able to cope with living in a catastrophic environment. This is precisely the way in which th the, uh, the indigenous are today seen, but in an exemplary way and as a kind of model of resilience for the rest of humanity. So I think there's something deeply troubling going on there, both for indigenous peoples themselves, who, ha who are then asked to live up to the expectations of resilience. You know, one question I have is, well, what happens? What, what are the implications for indigenous peoples when they are not, for whatever reason, resilient, when they don't demonstrate these, these capacities for resilience, but also for the rest of humanity, which is then forced to, to think in terms of how it must exemplify the very same um, characteristics of survivability and coping with stress and catastrophe and trauma, so on and so forth. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure.